Hi all, hope everybody's uh, well tonight. I think we're just going to give it a couple more minutes, wait for uh, any, any stragglers to, to join and then we'll, we'll kick off the event. In the meantime, uh, Beth just posted a, uh, a message in the chat, if you could, could take a read through it and uh, uh, similarly respond, respond with any information or any questions or comments, that'd be great. Hi, for anyone who's just joined, uh, Beth just posted a, a short message in the chat. If you just take take a look at that, um, and if people are happy to to post their name, their pronouns, where they're joining from, and what you're hoping to get from this event, I'd be really interested. Hopefully, you can kind of kick off a bit of a bit of parallel chat in the uh, in, in the chat box as well. Can someone just give me a a thumbs up or a, uh, some kind of reaction if they can uh, they can see the messages in the chat. Uh, have you? Ah, Dominic. Um, I can see Dominic Simpson's message. Thank you. Uh, from Hackney, Labour for a Green New Deal. Great, great to have you, Dominic. Uh, okay, em Emma's just said that, that the settings have been changed. So uh, we'll try that one again. Yeah, if people can just uh, share their name and pronouns if they wish where they're joining from and what they're hoping to get from this event. I think what you're hoping to get from this event can really just be to learn a bit more, um, to sort of, yeah, discuss things with like-minded individuals, or if you've got a specific interest, a uh, specific thing you want to get out of tonight, then uh, do share. And I'm sure more than, more than sure that will come up in the breakout room uh, discussions later. Hi, Miriam from Flincher, thanks for joining. Great, it's all, all, all seems to be coming in now. We've got Angela, Rosie from Leeds, Debbie and Tony from Uxbridge, Sandeep, Richard, Richard F, I think a uh, familiar, familiar face in Labour for a Green Deal. Hi Patrick from Working, Thank, thanks for joining. Vicky, Nick, David, John, great. Yeah, it seems like uh, I think the message has got through. Everyone, everyone seems to have joined. Um, great. Well, thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining. Um, it's really great to see so many people here tonight. Uh, it's, you know, it's sort of really chilly Monday evening, uh, but I am, for one, thrilled, thrilled to be here to launch the new action guide, Growing the Internationalist Roots of a Green New Deal, which you can now download from the chat. Uh, I think Beth or Emmett will, will post a link there. My name is Alex. I'm the co-lead of the policy and research team at Labour for a Green New Deal. And I'm going to be chairing the discussion tonight between our two very esteemed and distinguished guests, uh, Ewan and Harpreet. I think, yeah, to start with, with COP26 having just passed, we've seen that instead of taking the lead to deliver climate justice, Leaders from the global north have actively excluded those on the front line of climate breakdown and failed to make any concrete commitments towards rapid decarbonisation. To start this session today, and to really give everyone an idea of what's at stake, we're going to watch a brief documentary uh, from an organisation called Electronics Watch. They were really influential in our thinking and writing the action guide, uh, an incredible organisation who 
really uh, sort of been bold and ambitious uh, in demanding better from supply chain justice, uh, demanding better from electronics organizations and companies in the global north, uh, and in the unfortunate absence of anyone from the global south or from the uh, yeah, for who sort of work in these supply chains, unfortunately not being represented here tonight. Uh, I think it's really important we start by anchoring this discussion uh, with what's at stake. Emmett, are you uh, please able to, to share your screen and start the documentary? The Philippines is home to beautiful tropical scenery enjoyed by many tourists. But behind the scenes prepared for tourists, another industry overshadows the lives of the people, mining. Tourist sites show a clear blue ocean with coral reefs, but just as evident is how mining operations are altering the landscape in massive scales. Let's take a dive into one of those sites in Mindanao. This is the result of years of nickel mining by multiple mining companies operating in the area. Nickel is a key component in high capacity batteries required for electric vehicles, storage of renewable energy and the energy transition. Supply chain studies have shown that a portion of the nickel mined in this area has already been supplied to some of the most prominent battery and automakers. What used to be lush forest has now become barren land, and a sea of coral reefs is now filled with red sludge. We found local residents looking for something in the bay. <laughs> what she was looking for was shells. <laughs> <laughs> the girl was looking for food in the sludge, but is it really safe? Research has shown that a toxic heavy metal, hexavalent chromium, is exceedingly high in the water that flows into the bay where the girl was gathering shells. The WHO's safe drinking water standards say hexavalent chromium should not exceed 0.05 milligrams per litre. However, Research has shown hexavalent chromium levels to be much higher than what is deemed to be safe, even from water sources that the local residents use for cooking and washing. This resident has skin conditions, which she claims to have gotten after contact with the waters in the bay where the girl was collecting shells. <laughs> After years of criticism by NGOs and requests by local residents for clean and safe drinking water, some local residents still have to rely on spring water with exceedingly high levels of hexavalent chromium. Although the water may look clear and clean, it can still carry poisonous heavy metals. If this testing tube turns pink, it signifies the presence of hexavalent chromium. Even the slightest shade of pink is beyond safe drinking water levels designated by the WHO. Water contamination is not the only problem faced by the people. These Mamanwa indigenous people were forcibly evicted by the military at gunpoint from their ancestral land. With nowhere else to go, some communities had to live by the river in makeshift tents for the time being. Oh, tanaw ka ng utso ka tao ang mukain. Utso ka tao ang mukain. Gamay na lamang, gamay na lamang ang gidong ab tungod sa pagkawalay among ka. Some have moved into residential blocks prepared by the company, but life is nothing like what it used to be. For communities that were offered residential blocks, the people still could not hunt or gather. There are no natural bounties. Everything has to be bought with cash. The people have never been in need of so much cash in their lives. We asked one of the local mining companies what they were doing to compensate the Mamanwa people. Uh, the MOA signed by them is a 1%. The, the 1% is really in the bank. download mm -hmm. mm -hmm. 
Tulo na katuig, wala maghatag ang sinso mining og 1% royalty sa mga lumad. It was only after blockades that royalty payments began flowing to the indigenous people. This did not happen only with this company. Other locally active companies, including Japanese mining companies, also delayed royalty payments to the indigenous people. Handa mo lang nga sa una, kanin diri nga suba, diri pata ng mana, diri pata ng inhas, kanin diri nga bukid, diri pata nagpuyo, nagbalay, pero karoon nga mining na. Amo yung pinakadakaw, naalala yung sa pagmahay nga nung naingani na, karoon nga nga ang epekto sa mina. Gumikan lang po lagi sa abang mga katikulangan nga nagunang mga leader nga wala pa ilang kaibalaan kung unsa di ang pinakadakaw ng epekto sa mina. Walang para sa amo, kung balik na itong pano, kung kami ang sauna, wala di siguro yung mga katugot nga may ngani karoon ang kabukiran. Nico de la Mente was murdered on January 20, 2017 by two unknown assailants. He was prepared to testify about his people's sufferings to the National Commission on Indigenous Peoples that day in opposition to yet another mine expansion planned in the area. The companies historically involved in the local processing and mining all deny any relevance to the murder. The police do not have a suspect after years of investigation. This culture of violence and impunity has hampered local residents from participating in meaningful decision-making processes. Meanwhile, mining companies continue to exploit minerals from their land and expand their operations. We cannot continue casting a blind eye to the real costs of an unjust energy transition. Well, I think yeah, I think that video does does an amazing job of of really highlighting what it is that's at stake here, uh, and yeah, why we as a campaign uh, are, are so committed to campaigning for internationalism uh, and an international green new deal. I think it boils down to the fact that you know those of us on the left that want to achieve climate justice know that the global north must act to support oppressed and marginalised people around the world especially local and indigenous communities in regions where extractive industries fuel the production in the global north. The vast majority of products and services that we consume in the UK and similarly in other global north countries have their origins in the global south, whether it's the rare earth metals used in making batteries, the clothes you wear or the wood used to make furniture. This can often be traced one way or another back to the global south. But ultimately, the one step removed nature of this production the fact that it's the resources that go into manufacturing and not the manufacturing itself often means that it's out of sight and out of mind. But we know there is a huge amount of economic, social and environmental exploitation as a result of this, as multinational corporations leverage systemic power imbalances. In acknowledgement of this, and that for a Green New Deal to be just, it has to be international. And so tonight we'll be discussing what you can do at a local level to support international climate justice, using a handy new guide to released today by Labour for a Green New Deal, entitled Growing the Internationalist Roots of the Green New Deal. This guide has been put together by activists within the Labour for a Green New Deal campaign, especially drawing on the knowledge of the Glasgow Labour for a Green New Deal group, who have been really active over the last year in carrying out campaigns and awareness raising in the city to act locally for global climate justice. This guide has been made possible through the support of the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, who we'd like to thank for their support. Firstly, tonight we're going to hear from some amazing speakers, and then we're going to split into breakout groups to start thinking through some supply chain issues and how you can work to bring about supply chain justice in your local communities. But first, it's my pleasure and real privilege to introduce the fantastic speakers who have joined us this evening. Firstly, we have Harpreet Karpal, a human rights lawyer and campaigner for global climate justice. Earlier this year, Harpreet co-edited the illustrated book, Perspectives on a Global Green New Deal, which is a fantastic resource drawing on the voices of climate justice activists around the world to share their knowledge, expertise, and personal experiences of climate breakdown, its causes, and what needs to be done to bring about climate justice in a variety of different ways. Harpreet has also re recently co-hosted the podcast from Navarra Media, Planet B, Everything Must Change. I really recommend everyone listens to it for a thorough grounding in what the intersection between social and climate justice is 
and how this applies on a global scale. We were also joined by Ewan Kerr, a senior teaching fellow in environmental politics at the University of Edinburgh and co-lead in the Labour for a Green New Deal policy research team. Ewan will be able to tell you much more about the amazing work that the groups have been doing. I'd also like to reiterate and again acknowledge what seemed like, might seem like a glaring omission that we don't have anyone working on the front lines of supply chain in the Global South represented here tonight. We really did try hard to bring these voices into the room, but unfortunately didn't manage it this time, which is why it's really important that you go away and read perspectives on the Global Green New Deal to gain the insights of the people whose voices are often being marginalised. Right, I am delighted to introduce our first speaker, Harpreet Kapoor. I'd also like to invite everyone to post questions in the chat as they come to you, and after both our speakers have finished, we'll take a few of these questions. Harpreet, over to you. Thank you so much. And I've just posted, posted links of two videos, both from the Philippines, um, which is, as you've seen, a, a site of extraction for nickel, which is necessary raw earth metal for the energy transition. And those two videos, um, one of which is a link to the one that you've already seen, and the other one, a different site within the Philippines, really does highlight what's at stake here better than I can do in, in the few minutes that I have with you. But I'll try and do my best bringing in some of the insights, particularly from one of the authors of Perspectives on a Global Green New Deal's chapter on work, Seb um, Ordonez, who also works at War and Want. Um, and in a piece that he contributed to the book, and, and hopefully I can put a link to it, it's available for free, also funded by the Rosa Luxemburg Shifton and available online. He outlines the way in which um, narratives around green transitions and green new deals have enabled some mining companies to position themselves as guarantors of an energy transition, quite cynically claiming that they're the ones to provide the minerals and metals that are going to meet growing renewable energy demand. And we know that um, raw earth minerals and metals are required in the creation of solar panels and in, in wind energy, in um, hydropower and in electric car battery vehicles, as we've seen. But a lot of the mining companies um, that are positioning themselves as, as the saviors of a just transition are also invested in fossil fuel extraction. They're among the world's highest corporate emitters. And hopefully, as you've seen from the video, they operate in a very colonial model in which it's um, commonplace to dispossess countless communities of their lands of water, of access to nourishing um, facilities and of livelihoods and exploiting workers at their health, at the expense of their health and well-being. Miners are also amongst the most mistreated workers in the world. In July 2019, at least 43 artisanal miners died in the DRC due to a mine collapse at an industrial copper and cobalt mine owned by Anglo-Swiss multinational Glencore. And cobalt is also a vital part of electric car batteries. And UNICEF estimates that something like 40,000 children work in mining across the south of the DRC. And yet Glencore is positioning itself as part of the energy transition powering the electric vehicle revolution. And during the pandemic, a number of the companies have um, extended their threats to land defenders and exercised um, more controls over how people can come together in legitimate protests. And while the conversation in the North has turned to the need for a green recovery at the end of the day, when that re green recovery happens in a way that relies on Southern economies to provide um, the resources, the labor, that's going to make that happen. We're only cementing a logic that has got us into this crisis to start off with. 
And what we need to do instead really is both to think about reductions in carbon emissions so that we focus on what we need to live a good life rather than extracting and exploiting for energy consumption that is unsustainable just to replace the UK's current private car consumption we would need something like three times the three times the world's known reserves of raw earth minerals and metals it's really not possible to replace our current level of consumption with the level of raw earth minerals and metals that we have and so this requires a number of things I think I think it requires undertaking the campaigns that Labour for a Green New Deal are spearheading, calling on corporations to embed human rights, international labour organisation standards within their supply webs, insist that when Transport for London and Greater Manchester Authority procure buses and uh, as electric buses that they do so ethically in ensuring compliance with standards throughout their supply chain. But I think as we run these campaigns, we need to have these bigger questions about what does a fair economy look like globally? And it has to be one that leaves some resources in the ground and leaves some resources for communities in the global south to be able to transition in the ways that they need to, rather than extract um, resources and exploit workers for fueling unsustainable consumption in the north and the video that I showed focused on violations of access to land of indigenous rights of indigenous people's rights of um, environmental contaminations water contamination but I wanted to also give an example um, from the DRC more recently, the electronics watch uncovered with the Southern Africa Resource Center, um, showing that workers are working 12 hour shifts. They're having to walk sometimes hours to their mine. They're not paid for overtime. They're not given shelters in, in heavy rains, often forced to crawl under trucks for protection. And when they've complained about the hazardous work that they are undertaking, they often face um, repercussions and um, one team of 10 mining operators was given four gas masks to try and uh, prevent respiratory problems linked with cobalt mining. And there's very little health um, and safety protections and very little protections through the pandemic as well. And when the um, runoff from the mining goes into the local land, air, water, soil, it really harms local communities. Um, and globally, there's been concerns of risks of reprisals and land defenders are some of the most um, uh, face some of the most pernicious state abuse and in the past has been linked to corporate funded surveillance as well as those that have raised concerns about the land about working conditions within areas and so we can see here a real conflict confluence of economic exploitation extraction resource extraction dispossession from land and environmental justice these are all things that we see um, in the fossil fuel industry and when we talk about a green transition we need to talk about a just transition the countries that are being subjected to these types of conditions are also on the forefront of typhoons the philippines experienced super typhoons has experienced huge uh, devastation to its infrastructure the drc has experienced hundreds of thousands of people being exposed to floods the average person in the drc emits something like 65 fewer emissions than the every 
average person in the UK. So there's compounding and multiple injustices of disproportionate contribution historically of the crisis by the UK continued per capita disproportionate emissions driving the floods and the cyclones that we're seeing that are totally ravaging communities in the global south where it's estimated that loss and damage could reach up to 580 billion US dollars by 2030 within the next eight years or so. And even if we meet the Paris Agreement targets, over a million people would be displaced just from Bangladesh, one country. So we've got a context of climate impacts being faced disproportionately in countries that have done very little to cause the crisis and the resources and labor of those countries continuing to be extracted and exploited for a green transition in the north. And these are both things that can be addressed through the types of campaigns that Labour for a Green New Deal are hoping to run and through continuing to challenge what we regard as justice because we cannot replace our current level of consumption with green energy and that needs a kind of wider shift um, but it starts with running the kinds of campaigns that we're talking about um, launching here today so thanks for listening and for being here Thank you, Harpreet, uh, and thank you for, for all of the incredible work you're, you're doing in this space. It really is inspiring. Uh, I've heard you, you speak several times, and it's it's really inspiring every time, so thank you. Um, I think kind of two things really briefly stood out to me from what you were saying there in relation to the campaign and the campaign we're trying to run. And it's firstly, I think that kind of we on the left need to be prepared to call out and identify companies that are positioning themselves as part of a, a green transition. Uh, but continue to uh, exploit and abuse the workers who sort of, you know, from their perspective will be facilitating this. Um, I think a Green New Deal that's true to its, its causes of kind of social, climate and environmental and economic justice uh, cannot let these things go unidentified kind of in the name of decarbonisation uh, or, or putting Britain's or any sort of global North countries uh, climate debt first. And secondly, you, you use the phrase neocolonial, um, which I think is, is, is really useful. And I think we should start to try and develop a framework uh, around it, identifying how these power imbalances exist uh, and how they're being recreated. But yes, thank you. Uh, really, really great speech. Um, I'd just like to remind everyone again, if you uh, have any questions, uh, thoughts or comments, please do post in the chat. Uh, and we'll try and try and get to them afterwards uh, and give both uh, Harpreet and you a chance to respond. Uh, but now I'm excited to hand over to our second speaker, Ewan Kerr, who's going to give some background on what's been happening in Glasgow uh, in the past few months. Thank you very much, Alex. Thanks everyone for being here. Uh, thanks also to Harpreet for that really, really interesting contribution. Uh, so yeah, my name's Ewan. Um, my contribution today is really going to focus on what's happening in Glasgow at the moment. Um, because Glasgow was used as a case study for the uh, for the for the for the guide, so I think it's a useful starting point. And also, of course, as we will all no doubt be aware, unless we're living under a rock, um, recently Glasgow hosted COP26. So I think COP26 is a really interesting standpoint too, since we know that the outcome of COP26 has been very, very disappointing, you know. Um, I don't think anyone went into it thinking that it was going to solve all our problems, but even at that kind of, um, even with that in mind, the outcomes have still been less than exciting. They have not lived up to even our limited expectations. Um, and this is particularly the case when we look at voices from the Global South, who all kind of voice their, um, their opposition really to the, the way the negotiations were handled. Now in Glasgow, there was various obstacles to, um, to encouraging the participation of voices from the Global South, particularly, of course, from civil society movements in the Global South. Now, it wasn't limited to things like vaccine nationalism, but also a very hostile immigration policy. And it was very difficult for, um, for, for delegates and activists to get visas into the city. 
But I think more broadly as well, I mean, the fact that COP26 was held in Glasgow is itself very, very interesting. The choice of location is a very interesting one. And that's because Glasgow as a city, like many um, kind of industrial cities in the UK, occupies a really contradictory but central place, first of all, in development of fossil capital, but also... Um, it sets at a kind of nodal point in the emergence of empire as well. And I think what Alex and, and how Peter both said there about this idea of neocolonialism is really important. I think it's important that we as activists interrogate our past and interrogate where we've, where we've come from and our city's um, involvement in these issues. So um, let's talk a little bit about Glasgow and let's interrogate Glasgow's kind of past then. So it was in Glasgow that we can really say that we saw the first emergence of fossil fuel um, economies, right? And that, that's simply because it was natural fact in Glasgow Green, where James Watt came up with his idea to improve uh, and perfect his idea of the steam engine, right? So he was in Glasgow Green and he came up with this idea of how to perfect the steam engine. Now steam engines obviously run on coal. So this was the first example of the mass production of, uh, of, of, of a, of a, of a um, of a steam engine that ran on coal and fossil fuels. And this powered textile factories on Clyde site. But these textile factories obviously had to draw in um, raw resources from across what at that point was the British Empire. So we in Glasgow had importation of, of cotton, of tobacco, of sugar and such like. And it was the factories on Clyde site that turned them into products to be sold on a world market. So, that's all then to say that colonial, um, Glasgow has a long history of both colonialism and imperialism. These two ideas were central to the emergence of Glasgow as a major industrial city in the 1700s and 1800s. Um, but in addition to also importing um, raw materials from across the empire, we also began to export coal as well. So at the same time, we began to export coal and popularise coal as a really efficient use of, or efficient means to produce energy and such like. And indeed, Glasgow still does have streets named after prominent slave owners and also um, prominent industrialists of the time. For example, um, the Merchant City is named after these merchants. However, then in the, in the 1800s, we then see a shift from textiles in Glasgow into shipbuilding and also steam locomotives. Um, around about this time, the idea of something being Clyde built was really seen as a, a kind of mark of quality, you know. Um, but steam engines that we produced in Glasgow, again, were used to crisscross the empire. So these, these same steam locomotives. Uh, were used on the railway tracks throughout the empire. So again, Glasgow was central in kind of um, building, uh, building empire, supporting empire. Not to mention, of course, the fact that Glasgow built and ran most of the ships, um, commercial ships and, of course, military ships as well, that sustained and maintained the UK's dominance over the world. So again, we see that Glasgow has just got has got this real connection, first of all, to the extraction of fossil fuels, but also to colonialism and also imperialism. But things get more interesting still, because Glasgow was also the centre of the shift in the 1970s from coal into oil. So we see um, the, the, when we discover oil off the coast of, uh, of Scotland in the 1970s, we see a rush to displace coal as being the prominent um, uh, source of energy. And in 1970, uh, the British National Oil Corporation was headquartered in Glasgow. And this is very, very important. This idea of black gold was used um, to kind of transform both the Scottish economy, but also the UK's economy as well. This was seen as a saviour um, to the UK's um, failing economic fortunes at the time. And oil became at the centre of all government um, or successive government um, economic policy. So on the left, um, we in the Labour Party began to think of ideas of generating an oil fund. So this is Tony Benn's big idea about generating an oil fund similar to that which was um, uh, at that time was happening in, in Norway. But then in the 1970s, we also see a revitalisation of Scottish nationalism as a result of finding this oil. The, the SNP at that time famously ran their um, campaign slogan, It's Scotland's Oil. 
Um, but of course, we also had the, 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 the right wing on this as well. We saw how Thatcher privatised a lot of the, uh, the, 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 the public owned, publicly owned um, oil corporations. And of course, that money was used to fund dole queues and also um, uh, contributed towards being able to smash the miners um, during the miners' strike. Um, in addition to that, um, Glasgow at this time also was training up uh, many of the engineers and many of the technical experts that were required to work on oil rigs around the globe. So again, Glasgow has got this really interesting relationship to energy, to oil, to fossil fuels, to fossil capital, and also these kind of past legacies of colonialism. And Glasgow is not unique in this. Most industrial cities in the UK do. Um, I think therefore we've got this uncomfortable duty to, to, to interrogate um, where we've come from, where we're going, and what we can do. And that, of course, is what the Action Guide is there to do. But I think there's something else to note here as well. The story I've just told, told about Glasgow is very depoliticised. I'm not really including in there the idea or the, the fact, the actual fact, that Glasgow has got a, a vibrant and radical working class tradition as well. And that includes a radical form of anti-racism and, of course, of anti-colonialism. So... I think we have to bear in mind that the transition from one energy source to another is a political decision. These things don't happen by accident. A recent book by Andreas Mao uh, called Fossil Capital articulates this very well. These are political decisions. And we can't, we can't therefore escape the political dynamics of this. We have to be aware of the fact that these were politically contested um, transitions. And this is something that Glasgow knows only too well. So, the Thatcherite deindustrialization blighted Glasgow, much of the west of Scotland as well. Decisions made over transitioning from coal into oil, and then of course, in terms of the ownership of these resources as well, was always taken by callous governments or by remote men in boardrooms. So these multinational corporations are allowed to make these decisions almost willy-nilly. And even now, Scotland's economy, over a third of Scotland's economy is now owned by overseas foreign capital. So this is a, really a lesson for us. We know, number one, that these transitions are political. And we also know, therefore, that the market does not offer us up the solution. So we need is a, a planned response to these things, a planned socialist response that puts the voices of workers and those at the hard end of injustice at its centre. And again, Glasgow's got a long experience of this. So in the 1910s, we had the rent strikes led by Mary Barber. We've also got a long history in Glasgow um, of, ra of our radical political tradition as well. The, Internet, uh, the Independent Labour Party um, was, had a particular um, stronghold here that included uh, Jimmy Maxton as well as John Wheatley, but also uh, Marxist educators, for example, John McLean and radical trade unionists like Jimmy Reid. But again, this tradition has always had a huge anti-racist and anti-colonial mindset to it. So Glasgow was the first city to offer Nelson Mandela the freedom of Glasgow in 1981. In 2005, there was a very famous um, campaign led by a group of school, uh, school, school girls from, from Chapel called, who came, became to be called the, the Glasgow Girls who raised awareness of the plight of detained asylum seekers and refugees. More contemporary as well, we saw the Battle of Kenmuir Street just this year, where the hundreds of citizens of Glasgow um, prevented the deportation of two asylum seekers. And of course, in COP26, we have the, 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 the coming together of the climate and also um, trade union movement. And this was best exemplified by the strike by the, the, the GMB union who were representing cleansing workers. And Greta Thunberg very famously tweeted in support of. So again, this is all to say that climate politics and class politics are um, inseparable. They are fundamentally linked linked. In order to merge these together, we can't take our eye off the central um, features of working class struggle, international solidarity, and of course, global justice as well. And that's what we in Glasgow Labour for a Green New Deal have been seeking to harness. And we're seeking to create and um, create a campaign that can articulate in innovative, innovative ways the, the, the solutions we need to urgently take the action we need to avert 
climate catastrophe. And we've really done this in a number of ways. First of all, we've, uh, we had a really good launch event where we kind of networked around different, um, different interests in the city. And this allowed us to identify both our allies and also the issues we wanted to campaign on. After that, we began to work within our CLPs in the city. So we encouraged um, our members to go into the CLPs and pass motions, which again allowed us to build momentum behind the central ideas of a Green New Deal. And that was extremely successful. My uh, close comrade, Kim, um, has reminded me, I actually forgot about this, but we actually did get a, a policy commitment um, in the Scottish Labour Policy Forum um, for the following to be included. Uh, that reads, Scottish Labour will promote global justice by advocating for policies such as cancelling debt and freely sharing tech and resources for a just transition. So we found that was a really good success that we had. We managed to put front and centre on the agenda of the Scottish Policy Forum um, this idea of global justice. As a group, we've also worked with, um, with other allies in order to produce submissions to Glasgow City Council's um, consultation on the climate emergency, and we've also worked alongside our allies with um, Glasgow Calls Out Polluters and Divest Strathclyde to successfully, um, uh, to successfully demand that Glasgow City Council divest its pension fund from fossil fuel industries. And we've been helped along the way here with sympathetic MSPs and also councillors. But it's also important to note that um, despite our successes, we are quite a small group. There is only really about 45 of us that are active at any one time. And that thing that shows what a small group of dedicated activists can achieve. So really, you can, um, you can do a lot even with a small number of people. So I think just to wrap up then, Glasgow has had a very complicated and contradictory role within these discussions. We see on the one hand how uh, it's complicit within developing a carbon economy and also, of course, some imperialism and colonialism, but also, on the other hand, our long history of radical, militant, working class struggle as well. I'll leave it there because I think it's much better we get into our discussions, but I'll happily take any thoughts in the discussions or at this point. Thanks so very much. Thanks, you, Ian. Uh, yeah, really, really interesting. I'm sure there were more than a few people uh, in attendance tonight who wish their teachers and lecturers might have been quite so interesting. So, uh, yeah, thanks for the, the history lesson, but also to, to, to say that a lot of the content that you has been, been talking through uh, is present in the action guide. Uh, we really sort of thought there was a value to rooting our action guide with a specific case study. Um, so if you yeah if you're interested in hearing more about the work that Glasgow's been up to, uh, definitely definitely give it a read. Uh, and then you know if you're from the area, uh, follow up and get involved. I just think there's one question that that, that that's come up um, so far that uh, Harpreet I think we've been really interested to hear your thoughts on the question and also uh, kind of any answers or, or examples you can give. It was Ronan's question which said, are there any examples of governments in the global south stopping the continued exploitation of workers in mining, for example, in Bolivia, or where projects have been stopped by protests and or resistance? There are many. I won't be able to kind of list um, all of them, but I just wanted to highlight a study that was done, at, well, it was just published recently that showed of 38 large scale mining conflicts in Argentina, a mobilization stopped around half of them um, and restricted mining. Um, and then more, uh, you know, not just thinking about um, I know we've been focusing on raw earth minerals and metals for the renewable energy transition, but closer to home, Stop Cambo protesters got Nicola Sturgeon to commit to saying that the UK government shouldn't be expanding oil and gas extraction west of Shetland, um, which was quite a big deal, again, showing the strength of people coming together and mobilizing for a concrete target to make this broader case. Um, and again, focusing on the UK as an example, up until a couple of years ago, UK aid money was still funding fossil fuel projects. 
And again, very strategic campaigning by uh, a number of campaigners um, stopped that. But just before the UK heeded to their calls to stop funding fossil fuel projects, the UK did invest £750 million pounds in a gas project in, the Mo in Mozambique, in, in Cabo Delgado province. Um, it, Mozambique's a poverty-stricken northern province, um, and Friends of the Earth has suggested that the displacement of local communities from the land by the gas projects has worsened violence in the area. And so although there was a really successful campaign to get the UK to stop putting money um, into fossil fuel projects that wasn't before this one had been launched. And so there's an active campaign by Friends of the Earth and others to seek for that to stop. Um, but yes, there are examples all the time um, of successful mobilizations within the global south really interesting organizations like trend asia bringing communities together bringing uh, workers together bringing students together to resist sites of extraction um, i think when thinking about what we can do from our position within the uk to be in solidarity with communities for me again it comes back to campaigns like this one that's being launched um, communities in the global south are doing it this work in very uh, precarious contexts and really need to see that solidarity from communities in, in the north saying that even when mining is continuing that there are decent public buyers in the north that are going to be centering sustainability and workers rights throughout the supply chain and, and seeking justice and compliance for that and um while it's really important to kind of stop the mining and, and to act in solidarity with those campaigns. I think it's also important to acknowledge that we live in a system that's going to continue to see mining and to support the workers and the communities that that are forced to live near those sites and work in those conditions. I think that's a, that's a really great expansive answer. One, one thing that occurred to me just as the, the question was posed as well, um, I was recently writing a lecture on climate justice um, in, in Latin America and I came across uh, a number of, of countries, two main ones, so Ecuador and Bolivia, who in actual fact um, have, um, they, they've recently went through, by recently the last 10, 15 years, have had constitutional conventions. So they've had a constitutional assembly to sit down and to discuss the formation of a new constitution and what should be in that new constitution. And one thing I thought was really interesting was in both those cases, in both Ecuador and, and, and in, uh, in, in, in Bolivia, they have now got a constitutional commitment towards protecting Pachamama or the rights of Mother Earth, which I thought was absolutely fascinating. And I think what it really shows is that um, there's something to be learned in that about the idea of, of constitutionalizing the rights of nature itself. You know, I, I think that's a really, for me, a really interesting development. And I think um, if that is required to prevent, um, you know, extractive um, uh, multinational corporations to to behave themselves, then that's certainly something that more countries should be looking at. Um, but yeah, just a, just a wee add in there, I think. Yeah, thank you, Ewan. Um, so yeah, now we've heard some background to what international climate justice looks like and some of the work that's already been going on in the UK. It's time to think about what each one of you can do. And thankfully, yeah, we've, we've just produced this amazing new resource that can explain how you can engage in local action with an international impact. The guide looks at how we can pressure what's known as anchor institutions, which are key bodies, organizations, companies locally, such as schools, universities, and large private employers, uh, how we can pressure them to engage in supply chain justice uh, and the different approaches you can take. The guide really 
starts from the basics. It starts at setting up a campaign, building a campaign, how you engage members, how you engage the wider public, and then goes on to give some really specific uh, and I think really, really useful advice as to how you can target supply chain uh, justice within these institutions. Um, looking at how it is they procure goods, the obligations that they might have that you can sort of leverage into further commitments or further actions, and then brings out case studies. Um, we look at the way Camp Glasgow have built their campaign, but also use the work, uh, as already discussed tonight, by Electronics Watch uh, in how they've been quite so successful in uh, campaigning for climate justice, but also explicitly talking about the standards that they try and bake into uh, contracts uh, and obligations of these style of institutions. So whilst we, yeah, whilst we look at Electronics Watch, uh, I think broadly we should try and take an industry agnostic approach to this and understand that these principles can be applied to any key decision-making body that has an international impact. Um, I, for one, am really excited to see these you guys go away, create and germinate these campaigns uh, and see how these principles are put into practice in a whole wide range of scenarios and solutions. Yeah, so now it's your turn to start thinking about what you can do on a local scale to bring about global climate justice. I'm going to pass over to my comrade Emmett, who will explain the next part of this event. Thanks all for listening so far. Thanks very much, Alex. And yeah, thanks, Harpreet and Ewan as well. Um, so I'm just here to, as Alex said, introduce the next part of the event, which is where you guys come in. So I'm just going to share my screen so that you can see some information about our breakout groups, which is going to be what we're doing now. So as Alex has just said with the action guide, um, it's a really thorough um, sort of handbook, basically, for how you can build a campaign around supply chain justice in your local authorities or other um, key institutions or public bodies in your local area. And so we're going to do a sort of hypothetical workshop scenario exercise in small groups um, to think about the supply chain of a product or um, sort of purchasing for infrastructure development um, and think about what issues there are within that supply chain, both in terms of social justice and um, environmental justice. And uh, I'm going to pose some questions to you to think about how you might build a campaign um, around a specific aspect of a specific supply chain. Um, so yeah, just to reiterate, it is a quite hypothetical exercise, so don't get too bogged down in the details, just um, use it as an opportunity to come up with some uh, innovative and exciting ideas. Um, and think about the way that you're working together as a group and keep your conversations kind and fair and acknowledge the privileges that you might have and allow time uh, for others to speak who um, might, be, might be less privileged than yourself. So I'm going to um, flick through some slides very quickly, um, but when you get into your groups, if you could nominate someone who can take a few notes um, and then hopefully we'll have time for some feedback afterwards, probably not from every group, but from a few groups that I'm going to pick on. Um, so some of the questions that we want to think about are around extractivism and the sort of initial part of a supply chain um, where the kind of raw materials come from. So each group is going to be given a um, specific product or um, uh, purchasing for infrastructure that you're going to be thinking about. Um, and if you can just come up with a few different raw materials that might be used in that um, in the production of whatever it is that you're looking at um, and then maybe just choose one of those raw materials and think about a few different questions so what region of the world um, this material is extracted from what the colonial and imperial history of that region is um, and if there are indigenous people or other communities whose land might be in unjustly exploited during this extraction process um, and then also think about the sort of natural environment that this resource is extracted from and what the impact of this extraction might be on the environment. Um, and then finally, um, think maybe a little bit about the transportation of that material to a manufacturer and how that, that um, material is transported. So again, don't get too bogged down in the detail, but just some, a way to bring up some thoughts around uh, these questions. And then the second part of 
what we're asking you to do is something around uh, what your campaign might look like when you're thinking about this uh, supply chain that you've just come up with. So try and come up with a specific demand that you could place on a public body to secure justice in this supply chain. So perhaps are there any ethical or environmental certifications that you could be pressuring your um, public body to um, adopt? And I know there's some issues with things like this, but um, if you can just think, possibly think of a few ideas, um, then it definitely gets the juices flowing. Um, and then when you're carrying out your campaign, perhaps have a think about what your uh, what techniques you might use to raise awareness um, with the general public around this supply chain. And then finally, have a little think about what uh, sort of natural links of solidarity there might be between people in your local area and the people who are um, part of this supply chain. So perhaps it might be industries that have a lot of overlap. There might be specific trade unions um, where you might be able to forge links of solidarity. And how could you possibly build a connection between these different groups of workers to inspire them to take part in your campaign? Um, so I know that that's a lot of information and my comrade Beth is going to share a link to this presentation um, into the chat box so that you'll be able to see um, the questions that I've just asked. So hopefully someone in your group will be able to get that up. Um, and then in the uh, presentation, there's a slide for each group to input some notes from their discussions. If you want to, you could just take notes on paper as well, but if you want to take notes into the slides, then that would be really great. So just um, scroll down to the slide that is specifically for your group and um, you can take some brief notes there. It doesn't have to be very much. And if you don't get around to all of it, don't worry. As I said, it's just a sort of exercise to try and get everyone thinking a little bit. So I am going to open the breakout groups in one second let me just um, emma just to say i i know to be run slightly over schedule so far is there a time frame that we should be asking uh so uh, i think we got for this exercise if we stick to 15 minutes for this i think we had said 20 originally with 10 minutes for each section um but we'll just stick to 15 minutes um because like you say we have run close to time so emma uh, sorry before you do that i can I hear my daughter struggling, so I'm going to, she's next door trying to resist her bedtime, so I'm just going to thank everybody so much for your time and just very quickly give an example, a very concrete example of students at higher education um, universities throughout the UK that said that the laptops and the phones and printers that the universities procure shouldn't be implicated in sweatshop labour. And this type of scheme has improved um, conditions of workers, reduced exposure to toxic chemicals, reduced um, workers working in uh, threats of modern slavery. And so it works. And I'm really excited about the, the fact that you're doing this work and that you're all here. And I'm sorry, I can't join you for your breakouts, but thank you so much and, and look forward to hearing from you all about how this progresses. Good luck. Thanks so much, Harpreet. Good luck with bedtime. <laughs> um, great. I'm going to open the rooms now. If yeah, if you could do probably about seven minutes for each part of this exercise. But like I say, just see how you get on. Um, and if you've got any questions, feel free to jump back into the main room and ask them. Thank you very much. Enjoy. so 
I've just started the recording again. <laughs> um, because we are running very close to time, unfortunately, we're not, we haven't really got time for people to feed back um, by speaking to the whole group. But I'd really invite everyone to post into the group chat, um, into the chat box, just to maybe with what you were talking about, or maybe just some other thoughts that came up during that exercise, um, or anything that you've learned today, really, just to, to let everyone else know what you're going to be taking away with you. Um, so I'm going to pass back to my comrade Alex now, who is just going to close up this event for us. And thank you very much for your participation in that exercise. Yeah, well, again, thank you for your contributions. I really hope now that you'll be able to go away and apply some of that thinking to existing supply chains in your local areas and about how you can use this knowledge to bring about real change in local authorities or in other key public bodies. Before we wrap up though, there are a few next steps that we can take. Loads of links have been posted in the chat, but you know, follow them, engage in the campaign, download the action guide. Um, yeah, there's a wealth of materials that have been posted so far. Um, you, can, you can go back and refer to them. But at this stage, really, it, it's your turn to start thinking about setting up a local campaign. To help with this, we've made WhatsApp groups for different regions of the UK, which you can join to connect with other activists in your local area and to support each other in your campaigns. The links for these local groups are going into the chat, and you can find them on the Google slides, which we shared with the breakout groups. We'll also email out the details after the event. Finally, if you've got any questions at all, you can get in touch via the email education at labour.uk. That's education at labourgnd, sorry, education at labourgnd.uk. Uh, that'll be posted in the chat as well. Thanks all so much for spending your Monday evening with us and good luck in your campaign. Thank you. All right.